and so to also to paint uh, canvas that you used to be able to buy for 35 cents a yard, a dollar and a quarter a yard is can be 12 to 15 dollars for the heavy dough. Uh, red, a quarter of red paint can be 32, 35 dollars. So you you do find that today among the contemporary artists that they are um, recycling materials. They are creating sculpture, various objects of wall reliefs, even um, even things that resemble paintings out of found materials. Uh, presents a problem for the young artists, for the contemporary artists, that there's almost no place to put that. Few people will buy it. Some of it is extremely fascinating and interesting, but it is not the kind of thing that collectors would invest their money in. So we have the problem of uh, the money to develop the artists, the money to develop um, the warehouse, the museum, the space to collect, the, the money to preserve, the money to restore, the money for temperature controls. So that essentially is, um, those are the obstacles for, uh, for, for black people. Um, and it comes down to lack of economic resources. Now, the, the dominant institutions within the United States have almost no works of art by um, black artists. The best collections are in the black universities, at Atlanta University, at Hampton Institute, at Fisk, at Tuskegee, and at Tougaloo. There are wonderful collections there. Um, you know, basically uh, developed by uh, donations of visual artists who have worked in the institutions through the years. Looking at the situation back in 1974, uh, Joe Overstreet and I decided to um, do something about this. In, in a way, we were thinking about Louis Armstrong. When I grew up and saw Louis Armstrong on television, he was mopping his brow and singing Blue Mary Hill. You know, my father listened to the blues every, uh, every Saturday. And that's sort of what I knew of Louis Armstrong. When I went away from home, I heard Library of Congress recordings that Louis Armstrong made when he was 12 or 15 years of age. Brilliant, brilliant trumpet solos. Um, incredible music. And so I, I, I thought a lot about how he became sort of frozen in, in, in a kind of a cliché demanded, demanded by his audiences. And so what we decided to do was to create a place where uh, African American artists could experiment, and that's that's what we've done. Um, where we would encourage, support, nurture visual artists through their formative years. So at Kinkalabo we show young artists. Very often I'll give people their first exhibition. Um, I also will show people who are changing directions and who have lost their audience because they've moved on to something else. I'll show people who are, have worked for 15 years without adequate attention. And then we'll show, um, we'll show other um, so-called third world artists in the context of uh, African American culture. That's what we do. And well, I will say to you that I think that the creative process opens avenues for cultural and social and economic development. That in allowing the imagination to work, in developing the tools of analysis, um, it, we develop resources for business, resources for uh, invention, resources for, um, for survival. Pretty much that's what I wanted to say about the context in, in which we work, and then I thought I would show you some thoughts of some of the things that we do. And I would like very much to hear your response to, um, to some of the uh, things that I'm going to show you, and also to um, see if I can answer any questions that you might have. If you use the slides, you might I 
unless you see it. That's true. Yeah. You know, an opinion, that, you know. Yeah, and I've, I've, got, I've got a few things here that I think are very important for you to see. Um, and I want to know what you think. What would you think of the say? Never been out of the studio before. It took um, five men to carry it 
to carry them out of there into our gallery. I, I didn't want them to leave. They're the most beautiful thing. They're made of teak wood and rosa mala, which is um, a, a wood that grows in Java and Bali, but is a very rich dark brown with black streaks in it. And so each of these, uh, the, the way the body moves with the grain of the wood is, uh, is astounding in these pieces. The one in the center, uh, is the is the figure of a Japanese dancer, and on the back you can see that it's sort of cut off. There's a monster, and that's the ghost spirit that haunts the dancers. Um, you know, he, if you've ever been by Holland Hospital, there's a sculptural steel relief along the uh, right along 135th Street, and that's also work by John Roden. And there's an enormous piece of steel behind Bellevue Hospital that you see from the FDR Drive. So if you're heading north, um, I think you can see it by heading north on the FDR Drive. When you get near Bellevue, just look over and you'll see an enormous piece. He does a lot of public commissions. He's not, um, he certainly is not as well known as he should, um, as he should be. He's a, a master sculptor. We, um, incidentally, we like to, um, to to show wood sculpture because it is an African retention that thrives. And there's almost no place for artists to show the work that they do in wood because it doesn't have the durability that some other materials have, you know, of the steel and so forth. So um, every couple of years we, we do um, a wood sculpture exhibition. the United States was 
decided that we should not look at the separation between North and South America, but to look at it as, um, as lands, in, in, including the Caribbean and Central America, as lands where the people traveled back and forth throughout the ancient world. So that's what we attempted to do. We brought artists together from all the way from Chile, all the way up through, through uh, South America to Mexico. Throughout the Caribbean, we were able to reunite uh, the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Um, from North America, we invited a Cheyenne Native American and a Mohawk, from Can Mohawk woman from Canada. Um, in the center, you will see um, a wood sculpture by the Haitian artist Maxi um, St. Felix. And on the back wall, um, a piece by Juan Bosa the Cuban artist. Both of these pieces um, work with the idea of uh, Santeria or the, uh, the, the god uh, Shango. Uh, this is just the detail I thought you, I would show you some of the fine paintings that, um, that both uh, employed in looking at the African heritage of, uh, of Cuba. This is from a recent exhibition. That we did this in October. This is the work of Elizabeth Catlett. And she is probably the most famous uh, African-American woman sculptor. This is a piece called Pensive. On the back wall are her lithographs. She's going to have an exhibition of her prints at the Jamaica Art Center in the next few months. And maybe you might be interested in watching for that in the paper. She's very fine. She, her passport has been taken away from her for a number of years because of her um, political um, leanings. She was considered uh, to do the bust of Martin Luther King that is at, at the uh, Congress in Washington. But because of her political leanings, they would not allow her to And this is uh, a painting called uh, The Evil Eye. It's, it's an oil painting by the abstract painter Joe Overstreet. And it's about Storyville. You can ask uh, Professor Cannon about, uh, about Storyville because it, it was in New Orleans, which is his home. And this is um, uh, about the second line. The first line in the funeral march is very slow and mournful at the funeral dirge. And then on the return, it's a, a joyous uh, uh, rhythm of celebration. And that's what this is about. It's about the cornfields and, and so forth. You can see, if you, if you look at that figure, it's a figure, it's a face being held in a hand. And then you can see the marchers in the front and the the musicians um, in the upper right. As I mentioned to you, we also do the more historical exhibitions where we try to give the, the elders um, respect, where we, we try to um, show the work of artists who've been painting for many years uh, who've been overlooked. And this is the work of Huey Lee Smith, who and he's now, he was born in 1915, and he is just receiving attention at the age of, what, 73 or 74. Um, his work is noted for being what we, what we could call surreal, in that you can see by the very white light, his figures are always isolated, Usually there's a, a single streamer. How does this boy sing to you? What is his mood? What does he say about the environment in the thing? It's an isolated environment. What about the wall? Is that the ocean in back of it? It looks like it's the ocean. Well, it, it's broken, but it, at least it's still standing. It's you know, um, what I get from this, this is just my interpretation, is that um, there's a person who has placed himself in a very isolated environment, but the 
And I thought it was very, a very interesting statement from um, you know, young people who were 12, 13, 14 years of age. And there were some 70 paintings in that exhibition because, as I've said, our gallery is large. And that was the, that was the permit that they made. So this is Huey Lee Smith, and you may be beginning to see some of his work in the newspapers and so forth. This is the, um, the work of Elsier Courtois, uh, whereas Huey Lee Smith is, is originally from Florida and moved to Cleveland. Elsier Courtois was from the Richmond, the Tidewater region of Virginia, and he went to Chicago. Um, this is a piece from the 1950s in Chicago, and you can see that he's been looking at a lot of African sculpture. He's very interested in his pattern. Um, you know, he, his paintings often contain uh, mail that's not opened, newspapers, um, very frequently the pot belly stove. I'm sure he had one of those in the studio trying to keep warm in the, in the wintertime because I've seen it in, uh, in many of his paintings from that period. And so it gives you, it gives you a sense of the, um, the crowded conditions, um, of uh, Chicago, of, of tenements in Chicago. This is one of the most beautiful paintings that I've ever seen. This plot is um, not as good as it should be. It's, it's overexposed. You see the light is too harsh on it? Mm -hmm. This is a painting called Southern Gate. And it's by Elsie Um one of, uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this exhibition is that I had never seen anyone paint um, African-American women the way, uh, the way Couture has. Um, he received a Rosenwald grant in 1945 and 1946 to go to the Georgia Sea Islands off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, where the, uh, where the uh, Gullah language is spoken, where the African traditions are still very much intact, even to this day. And so he, he worked there for, um, for two years. And this is a painting that was done during that period. Um, you know, the bird resting on her shoulder, perhaps, um, is actually a Renaissance painting. It's a symbol of the Virgin, of, of, the, Ho of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps here, it's a symbol of her freedom, for, perhaps. Or the, um, if you look at the urn and the pillar in the back, you'll notice that they're cracked and chipped. Maybe that represents the falling away of the traditions of the Old South. You know, there's a cross. What about the cross? What about the cross? Well, I'm asking. <laughs> um, <coughs> is it for protection? Is being indicated? Well, it could certainly be for protection. What else, what else could it be for? If we're dealing with the African American experience, isn't it, uh, as in most cases when Christianity came into um, lives of people, that this was a blending of cultures as well, okay? So that you have a blending of African culture and Western culture. And that could symbolize that as a part of her existence, okay, or our existence. Is, um, does she look strong? Yes. yes. I think she looks extremely strong. The sky in the background of this painting is an indigo blue. Um, indigo is the color of, uh, of what that you wear all the time? Indigo blue? Blue jeans. Mm. You know they, how they are when they're, before you wash them, that rich color? Mm -hmm. Indigo was a plant that was brought from Africa and brought into the West Indies and it took them a long time before. I think it was Thomas Jefferson who brought um, African people from the West Indies to um, this country to process the dye, but the sky behind um, behind this woman is uh, is a very rich.
rich indigo color that you, you can't see. I'm really sorry about this. Don't tell me red, white, and blue. <laughs> oh, that's meaning the softest around yeah. her body. Well, you can. Hey, you know, if you ask Mr. Courtois, who is, um, was born in 1916, who is uh, about, and just turned 74, about his painting, what would he tell you?
earning a living. You know, this is very different from the kind of painting um, in the treatment of his grandmother. Let, let's see if, there, if I put another one in. Okay, this is the painting, uh, not really a goat. This is the painting owned by the Schomburg Library that they love to it. And the painting is backwards. The slide is backwards. See how the, the sign is... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, this is about the. Uh, no, yeah, we'll put it back. Yeah, I wanted to. No, oh, can you change Because that, that was a kind of important um, historical statement in that painting. Okay. In 1929, Mr. Motley received a Guggenheim grant to do what most black artists did at that time, go to Paris. And um, so this is one of, the, one of the few paintings that exists from, that, from 1929. What happened in that year? The stock market crash. Um, here he's painted the Jockey Club, which was the most famous nightclub in, France, in Paris at that time. And it was a club with black entertainment very much like the Cotton Club in, in Harlem, uh, where black people were not allowed to go. And so it's uh, the, uh, the statement in the painting um, relates to that. But you'll, you'll notice the, uh, the black doorman is also treated as, uh, as a kind of caricature there. But you can see here that he was really inspired by, uh, you know, by the French Impressionists. Painters. He liked to paint night scenes, and people people tell me that he painted with a candle at night. Let's see another. Okay, I just wanted to say to you that uh, we were concerned about young people, and so very often I turn our gallery into, uh, uh, especially in the summer, um, into a program for. Uh, neighborhood children. This, this is a class of printmaking. There. Um, and this is a preview of coming attractions. This is a painting by Norman Lewis. Um, it was done in 1935. It is called Madonna. He is beginning to become an abstract painter at that time. <coughs> We are going to do a retrospective of Norman Lewis's work in May and June. Norman Lewis um, died in 1979 at the age of 70, feeling quite bitter because he'd been overlooked. His family was from Bermuda. He was raised in Harlem and in the Bronx. And he, he may be the finest African-American artist that we've ever produced, but no one really has, um, knows, has really knows about his work in the way that they should. And so we're going to show almost 70 paintings in May and June. And if you uh, if you remember, I hope you'll come. I certainly will. And will ask uh, Professor Cannon to, tell, to remind you about it because you'll be able to see 50 years of this painting. But is there another? Okay. Back to the business at hand. These are the three abandoned buildings across the street from us. That's my little garden there. I put a little garden to stop the dog traffic between 2nd and 3rd Street. And so I have a lot of roses and I have sculpture growing in that lot now. And hopefully tomorrow we go to the Board of Estimates to find out if we'll be able to do artist houses in those three buildings. It's been an eight-year struggle with the city to get them to sell us the building. You said artist houses? That means that you will actually. We'll have 26 units of artist housing um, in those tenements that were the major source of the dump traffic in our block. I finally got the board and I was last summer. It was an eight year battle and it may be open tomorrow. Oh, good. So, and I think that's Um, some of the major entertainers 
home there, but um, not go in the front door, not go as customers. In other words, it was uh, black entertainment for for a white audience. See, and really, that's what you know. That's not what Cap Calloway said the other night on the no, film. He said that uh, it wasn't that blacks couldn't go and they couldn't afford it. He said if you could afford to go, you could go. But if you, you know, that's that's how he put it. When they asked him the question, because all the others had said that, and he said, "No, that's not correct. That's inaccurate. You know, if you could afford to pay to go there, you could go in the door. But if you could not, then it didn't make sense. well, but the but entertainers said they had to go in the back door. Well, he said otherwise. <laughs> he contradicted that. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's. Um, I wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't there. Um, and always, um, there are many different points of view. Um, I, I think, however, that the, the point that can be made is that we need to control our own culture, and we need to develop our own institutions, build our institutions, support our institutions. I know, for instance, that for the price of a night at the discotheque, um, you could buy the work of a young artist who's got your own collection. I know that. And I think that um, what we have to do is to stop having um, the artist collected for us, but let that happen as a natural sifting out through uh, performances, uh, through exhibitions, uh, and the support of our, um, of our own cultural events. I don't want to step into a point of There's also a gallery down on the Vanderbilt. Um, I haven't been there. 
I was just there last week. I, don't know <laughs> uh, I, don't know I can't remember the name. There, of there are several, several galleries. There's one um, spiral. Yes, spiral. And and there's a new one in a bank building somewhere that I haven't been to visit yet. It's in an old bank and it's in the Williamsburg section. Oh, that one. It's been open for a
of your hours. The hour is from Wednesday through Sunday, from 1 to 6. And the phone number, if you need directions or so forth, is 212-674-3939. Um, right now we have an exhibition of wall sculpture by, um, by young artists. And I think Wednesday's City Sun is going to have a photograph of, of one of the pieces in that uh, exhibition. And I'm especially hoping that you will come to see the Norman Lewis exhibition, which will be in May and June. And I'll be sure to send materials here. So because of and I'll remind you. You ought to require them to come. <laughs> okay, Dr. Jennings, thank you very much for being part of our lecture series here for Black History Month, uh, racism in print and non-print media. Uh, today's topic, I think, uh, was racism in the arts. <laughs> I've been saying this so much for time. Uh, but I think we've been running through the entire lecture series, starting with uh, Dr. Polani, and which will uh, end with the March 16th lecture on racism and sexism in the music industry, is the fact that we, as a black people, must support our own, okay, in whatever they're doing, because, and we must choose who we will accept as the best of us, not someone else. Thank you very much.
What are you talking about? The question? No. Uh, what are we going to do when they use those for the question? Well, you don't have to really answer them, but we're going to bring you up to a question. In other words, the reason I'm giving you those questions is when you read the book, read, that, read the book with those ideas. And then what we're going to do after we look at the movie, we're going to uh, base our discussion on that. Uh, so So anyway, you, you sure it's not like the same thing? I don't know. I thought this was jazz, right? Where is jazz? Oh, 